Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. If you're just tuning in, welcome. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime, unabridged stories, and other old-world medias just for you to fall asleep to or relax to. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. If you would like to listen to the standalone media, we have included a link in the description. Our last series followed the Frontier Man, but we're going to switch gears to the Adventures of the Falcon. Hailing from the 1940s, the hard-boiled spy drama is now around 80 years old. If you can provide proof of your existence when it released as a syndicated radio series, I will personally come visit and cook you a continental breakfast. Without further ado, let's get to listening. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Linda. Now, thanks for calling, Angel, but I can't make it tonight. The fellow was caught playing with matches, and it made him so mad, I have to get to him before he gets all burned up. This is Ed Hurley, he friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, transcribed today, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novel. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves... The Case of the Flaming Club. Before we join the Falcon for his latest adventure, here's exciting news from Kraft. It's more news about a new salad oil, Kraft Salad Oil, the first salad oil ever offered for your home use by the makers of all those wonderful Kraft-prepared dressings. Wait till you use this new oil in one of your salad dressings or baking recipes. For Kraft, salad oil is more than just a new oil. It's a lighter-bodied salad oil that blends perfectly with other ingredients. Adds new magic to every recipe it's used in. That's because it's not just refined. It's superfined by Kraft. Tomorrow, when you shop, be sure to get a bottle of lighter-bodied, superfined Kraft salad oil. Look for the bottle with the beautiful label. And now, the case of the Flaming Club. It's late Sunday night in New York when Eric Dean walks slowly to the door of his apartment. He looks through the keys on his key ring for the one which fits the lock. He tries one. After a couple of tries, gets it in the lock, but finds it won't turn. He's fumbling for another key when he hears someone on the other side of the door. Eric? Yeah? Is that you? Yeah, yeah, it's me, Georgia. Who are you expecting? Just a minute. Come on in. Yes, ma'am. No. You've been drinking. Is that a fact? Well, who wouldn't be? Went over the books at Larrabee tonight. We keep getting further in the red. In fact, we're broke. Now, isn't there any way to cut expenses? Cut expenses? Cut expenses? What are we going to do? We fired the band. Got to keep a bartender and a piano player. Oh, there must be something. We can stop eating. Cut expenses at home. Cancel my life insurance. Sure, we can cut expenses. No, it's no use talking about it now. I can see that. But tomorrow... I don't want to talk about it tomorrow. Just want to sing and dance. Come on, Georgia. Oh. Let's dance. No, stop it. All right, what's the matter? Don't you want to dance? Nobody wants to dance. Nobody wants to have fun. I want to have fun. Lots of fun. Laughs. I want to blow my brains out. <laughs> Ten thirty, and we got six couples. Well, Dean, it was your idea to chuck the band. My idea. They wanted to be paid. There's only one out. You mean there still is an out, Larrabee? One. What? Come on in the office. Okay. 
Don't tell me you found a sucker we can unload on. No, nothing like that. Girl, Larry? We could have a fire. What? You heard me. A fire. We have insurance. Are you crazy? It's been done. Yeah. People have gone to jail for it, too. Their only chance to get out from under. Can't you see that, Dean? I don't like it. There's a bottle. Now, wait a minute, pal. Nothing to drink until we get this settled. It is settled. No fire. Why not? A can of gasoline, a match, and we collect. I said no, Lara, but you talk too much. You'd be sure to shoot your mouth off. You think I'm crazy? I think if we got away with it, which we probably wouldn't, but if we did, you'd have to start bragging about how sharp we were. Dean, I give you my word. I know you, Larrabee. I know you'd start... What's the matter? Just a minute. I thought hey. so. All right, Morgan, what's the idea? Let go, Mr. T. You were listening at the door. No, one. Then what were you doing here? You're supposed to be at the bar. I, I just wanted to ask, to ask you something. There's a phone at the bar. There's a phone here. He's right, Morgan. What are you doing here? Well, Mr. Larrabee, believe me, I... I, I You've don't... been snooping. No, Mr. T. A snooper and a liar, too. Well, that's all for you, mister. You're through, as of now. Not so fast, Dean. What about my back pay? You owe me three weeks... Do it. Now, you can't do this. Don't tell me what I can do. You're fired. Don't be a fool, Dean. Get back to the bar, Morgan. I'll straighten this out with Dean. I'm not sure I want that. Now, be reasonable. Dean's upset, that's all. He doesn't realize what he's saying. Oh, don't I? No. Well, Morgan? All right, Mr. Larrabee. If you say so. That's it, Morgan. I'm sorry about Dean, but we've been having a lot of trouble. And... I'm not surprised with him asking for it. And believe me, if he keeps on like that... You haven't seen anything yet. <clears throat> What'll it be, mister? I'd like to see Mr. Dean. No, you wouldn't. Well, why do you say that? Nobody likes to see him. Okay, then let's say he'd like to see me. He phoned me. Oh, well, try that door back there. I think he's in the office. Thanks. Who oh, is it? Mike Waring. Oh, yes, Waring. Come in. Well, oh, good of you to come, Waring. Sit down. Thanks. Oh, what do you want with the detectives? Tell me. How good are you at shadowing? Good enough that I don't waste my time at it. If that's all you want, why pay my fee? This is something special. I got a partner, Mark Larrabee. I want a record of all his movements. Why? Does it matter? I want him followed. I'm willing to pay. You're willing to pay too much. I want to be sure nothing goes wrong. That's why I want the Falcon. Funny thing about me, Dean. When I'm on a case, I like to know what I'm doing. You'll be following Larrabee. Yeah, that's what I call a lot of information. I didn't know you were going to be so curious. It's my business. Well, I'm going away for a few days. Perhaps I want to be sure Larrabee stays away from my wife. Yes, perhaps you do. There are a lot of other detectives in town who'll keep tab for you. I'm not interested in that kind of business. Why not? I never cared for gossip. You wouldn't have to gossip, just report. See what I mean? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm not afraid of Larrabee calling on Georgia. Well, then we're right back where we started. All right, Waring, if you must know, here it is. Larrabee's been drawing a lot of money out of the business. I can't find out what he does with it. I think he's been gambling. I have to know so I can straighten him out if he is. Mm -hmm. Now will you take the case? Well, you know something, Dean? I still think you're lying. But if you're so anxious to dump cash in my lap, I don't see why I should deprive you of the pleasure. Yeah, all right. It's a deal. <laughs> Mister, in this doorway. You looking for me? No. How come you've been following me ever since I left the club? Have I? Oh, that's a brilliant conversation. Well, I'm not an old coward. I never would have known. Who are you? Does it matter? It matters that you're following me. What's the idea? Who told you I'd be following you? I got eyes. But I haven't been beating tom-toms. How come you spotted me? You just aren't as sharp as you think. Uh -huh. Or somebody tipped you. Now, who? Look, just because you're clumsy. Not that clumsy. We won't discuss it. You've been following me, and you're going to stop. Well, what's stopping me? This, if it has to. Is it loaded? Hang around, you'll find out. Oh, I'll take your word. 
I don't like to set up anyway. Good night, Larrabee. Hey, mister, I just noticed the time. You're out of luck. Well, not necessarily, driver. Yeah, but it's after two. The club will be closed. Well, I'm not going for entertainment. Just want to talk to the bartender. He may still be around. Okay, just thought you might want to know. Oh, thanks. Some guys raise holy net if you don't... Uh-oh. What's the matter? Fire engine. Hey, look, they're stopping in the next block. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I see the smoke coming out of that building. Hey. Well, what? Look up there. Isn't that the club where you wanted me to take you? Is it? Yeah, you're right, it is. It's on fire. Yeah, so I see. It's lighter bodied. It's super fine. It's Kraft Salad Oil. The first salad oil ever offered for home use by the makers of all those wonderful craft prepared salad dressings. Yes, you women who pride yourselves on your own special homemade salad dressings, now you have something new and wonderful to work with. Now, you know in advance that any salad oil offered to you by Kraft is bound to be good. But Kraft salad oil is more than just a good oil. It's a new kind of oil. A lighter-bodied oil made to blend perfectly with other ingredients. That's because Kraft salad oil is not just refined, it's super-fined by a special process created by Kraft. You'll find Kraft salad oil not only wonderful for your homemade salad dressings, but also for those grand chiffon cakes you bake. In fact, for every recipe you have that requires liquid shortening. So don't wait to try this new Kraft salad oil. Remember, it's lighter body. It's super fine. Get Kraft salad oil tomorrow at your grocer's. Look for the bottles with the beautiful label. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. It's a few minutes since Mike Waring discovered that his client's club could briefly boast of the hottest show in town. Now the falcon is pushed through the crowd and into the burning building. He makes his way through the smoke and flames to the basement steps, hurries down until he's stopped by a fireman at the bottom. Hey. Hey, where do you think you're going? I wanted to see what started this. Well, get out of here. You want to get killed? <coughs> Fake like I'm a fireman, too, huh? I got no time for games. Look, it's just that I've got a hunch there's something phony about this fire. I want... <coughs> hey, there's a lot of smoke. Look, what do you expect? Well, if I could just see a little... <coughs> hey... <coughs> Hey, look over there. Where? Here in that pile of boxes. Aren't those a man's legs sticking out from behind there? Uh, <coughs> I don't see any. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Come on. Yeah, here he is. That's Dean. Who? One of the owners of this place. Well, help me get him out of here. We can get him to the respirator. Well, I'm afraid out. artificial respiration won't do him any good. Well, you never can tell. Uh, in this case, you can't. <coughs> look at his chest. He's been stabbed to death. <laughs> Hello, Corbett. Looks like we've got the fire under control. Yeah, Waring. Now, come on over to the car. I want to get a few things straight. All right. But isn't it a waste of time, Corbett? You know you'll never keep them straight. Yeah, that's right, Waring. Make with the gags. Us police don't know from nothing. It takes a bright private op like you to bungle a routine tale so bad a man pulls a gun on you. I didn't bungle. He must have been tipped. By who? Well, that's one thing I'm going to find out. <laughs> really hurts, don't it? And now, Waring, tell me something about this fellow, Dean. I told you. He was going out of town. He wanted me to keep an eye on his partner, Mark Larrabee. I did, with the results that please you so much. Uh, what did Dean expect you to catch Larrabee doing? Well, he said he was afraid Larrabee was tossing his bankroll down a roulette rat hole. And he wanted me to check. Is Dean his partner's keeper? He claimed he was working at it. Did you swallow Dean's yarn? Would you? <laughs> you kidding but I'm not smart like you, Waring. Well, Dean's story smelled, but I played along to see how things lined up. And the fire coming right at this time seemed too much of a coincidence. You think Larrabee started it after he shook you? Well, it's something to check. Along with, how come Dean winds up in the basement of his club when he claimed he'd be out of town? He planned to leave. He hadn't gotten around to it. Well, how do you know? 
You're not the only one who can make brilliant deductions, Waring. I found an airplane ticket in his pocket to Pittsburgh on the 4 a.m. plane out of LaGuardia, from which I deduce he was planning to fly to Pittsburgh this morning. Corbett, you're a genius. Now, if you're through with me, I'll be running along. There's some angles I still want to look into. Why bother, Waring? Your client's dead. Look, I'm going to prove somebody tipped Larrabee about me tailing him. You don't have to prove it, Waring. Somebody did tip him. Yeah? Sure, Waring. You did. <laughs> Wait a minute, will you? I'm coming. Uh, oh, it's you, Harry. Don't you know it's the middle of the night? No, no, I didn't. My watch stopped. Uh, I'm laughing. Well, I wanted to get to you before anyone else did. Why? Because you work for Dean and Larrabee. Mm -hmm. I thought you might be able to tell me something about them. Like what, for instance? Like why you tipped Larrabee that I was hired to tail him. What are you talking about? How would I know? You could have listened to my conversation with Dean. Listened in? Me? You know my name. You called me by it just now. Well, you, uh, you told me at, at the club. Yeah, think again, chum. I just went into the club and stopped at the bar to ask for Dean. I never mentioned my name to you. Well, I... I... What's the difference if I do know your name? Because maybe that's not all you know. Maybe you know Dean hired me. And if I do? Then maybe you tip Larrabee. And if I did? Now, that'll break Corbett's heart. Who's Corbett? Sergeant Corbett, homicide squad. What's he... What's he got to do with this? He likes to rip me. You wake me up in the middle of the night on any kind of a rib? No, not entirely. There's been a fire. Did you know anything about that? Fire? Yes, the club burned down. What? Kind of a coincidence, wouldn't you say? Why? Coming right when one of the owners is suspicious enough of the other to hire a detective to tail him? You think Larrabee or Dean, the fire... Yeah, Larrabee or Dean, the fire. It didn't start itself. But they couldn't have done it. Why not? Well, you were following Larrabee, you say, and, and Dean was on a train to Chicago. Train to Chicago? Where'd you get that idea? Well, he told me. Dean, when? When he left the club last night around six. Dean said he was taking a train to Chicago. I told you. Yeah, I know, so you did. But that's not what the plane ticket says. What plane ticket? The one that's not for a train to Chicago. That don't make sense. Uh, no, pal, you're catching on. But why should it make sense? Nothing else in this case does. <laughs> All right. Oh, Mr. Larrabee. Hello, Morgan. I'm coming in. Sure. Sure. After all, why should you be an exception? Has someone been here already this morning? Hey, hey let go. Answer me. W Waring was here. Waring, did you talk? No. You didn't say anything about what you heard the other day, me and Dean talking about a fire. No, I didn't tell Are you. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Hey, what's the idea? I asked you a question. I answered. I want to be sure you're telling the truth. I am, I am. You better be, because that was just a warning, Morgan. If I find out you've been shooting your mouth off, maybe that's not all that'll get shot. Think it over. Hello, Mr. Waring. You mind if I join you? Why, what a question, Angel. Sit down. Thank you. You wonder how I know your name. Do I? Sergeant Corbett told me about you. He told me you eat in this restaurant quite often. Well, bless his little heart. I'm Mrs. Dean. Oh. The sergeant tells me you're suspicious about last night's fire. Mm-hmm. So I understand there's going to be trouble getting the insurance company to pay off. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised. You were following Larrabee, so you know he didn't start the fire. How do you know about that? Corbett? No. I talked to Morgan, the bartender. Ah, you're a busy little chicken for someone who just lost a husband. Oh, I'm on my own now. I have to look out for myself. Mm -hmm. But didn't your husband have life insurance? Yes. Then you looked after him. The fire won't affect that. I know. But I have a right to collect on the fire insurance, too. Mm -hmm. My husband wouldn't have started the fire. He wanted to prevent it. That's why he hired you. Yes, that's what I figured. But how do you know about it? He told me. He and Larrabee had an argument about it. Larrabee wanted to burn the place, and Eric was against it. You realize you're admitting that Larrabee had arson on his mind. Yes. 
But you were following him, so you know that he didn't do it. How do you know I didn't see him start the fire? Because then there wouldn't be speculation. You'd have had him arrested. All right, I didn't see him. But here's something Morgan didn't tell you. Larrabee shook me before the fire, so he could have done it after he left me. I don't believe it. I don't believe it's the truth. Oh, dear, I, I didn't know that that changes things. Yes, it certainly does. So I'm afraid I can't help you. But maybe you can help me. How? Your husband told me he was going out of town. Do you know where he was going? Well, of course. And do you know how he was going? Train or plane? Well, train. He doesn't like planes. He gets sick. I see. So I guess he missed the train. Yes, so it would seem. He had plenty of time. He left the apartment at 8 and said the train didn't leave until 9. Then he did intend to take the 9 o'clock train to Chicago. Hmm? Chicago? Well, yes. What's the matter? Well, he wasn't going to Chicago. He was going to Palm Beach. When you shop tomorrow, be sure to pick up a pint or quart bottle of Kraft Salad Oil. It's the wonderful new oil for your homemade salad dressings, your cooking, your baking. The first salad oil ever offered for your home use by Kraft. Remember, it's lighter bodied because it's super fine. Lighter bodied to blend perfectly with other ingredients. Don't wait to try Kraft Salad Oil. It's lighter bodied. It's super fine. Look for the bottles with the beautiful label. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. Half an hour has passed since Mike Waring learned that his client apparently had tried to dash off in all directions only to wind up where he started with a knife in his chest. Now the Falcon is at headquarters and has tossed the confusion to Sergeant Corbett. Wait a minute, Waring. Wait a minute. Uh, sure, Corbett. I'm not going anywhere. Let's get this straight. Dean tells the bartender he's taking the train to Chicago. Then he tells the wife he's taking the train to Palm Beach. If they're telling the truth. And when we find him in New York, he has a plane ticket to Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I finally figured it out, Corbett. Yeah, I know. He really intended to go to Kennebunkport, Maine. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, Corbett. You see, I checked with the Weather Bureau. Weather Bureau? Where do they fit? They told me there was a bad storm in Virginia. Very interesting. There was also an earthquake in Peru. So what? So I checked with the railroad. Dean got on the train to Chicago last night. Then I suppose he got on a train to Palm Beach. Well, I wouldn't know. Hmm. Gets clearer all the time. Well, if we can get that bartender to talk, it will. Yeah? Yeah. He had a fight with Dean a few days ago, and Dean tried to fire him. Oh, so you think this makes the bartender so sore he murders Dean and burns down the club? No, no, no. He'd hardly go that far just over the loss of a job. Check. But he knows something. And he's one up on me. Well, in that case, let's go catch up with him, shall we? Now, what do you fellas want? Have you caught up on your sleep, Morgan? Don't make me laugh. Let's go in, Waring. Yeah. Hey. You can close the door, Morgan. What do you want? You said Dean left the club at six last night. Yeah. Did he go back? No. He was killed in the club. Well, I mean, I didn't see him. And he wasn't hanging around the club? No. What are you trying to prove, Waring? I'm just trying to account for Dean's time. He left his home around eight. Turns out to be killed in the club at 2.30. Or what was he doing in the meantime? You got any ideas? Yes, Corbett, I have. I think he went to Philadelphia. Oh, great. Now he goes to Philly. Why? People keep coming here. I'm going to Philly or someplace. Oh, Larrabee. Hello, Morgan. I wanted to... Oh, company. I'll come back. No, no, don't mind us, Larrabee. Come in. I can come back later. Why are you so anxious to get away? Is it because you're afraid we found out about you? What about me? Did you and Dean had a row about the fire? You wanted a fire. He was against it. Morgan, I warn you. Hey, cut it out. Oh, cut it out. Larrabee, stop it. Dude. You're a smart boy, Larrabee. That outburst proves Morgan knows about you. What do you mean? Morgan didn't tell us. Mrs. Dean did. But now that you've shown that Morgan knows, too, he's going to have to talk. What else do you want to know if you know about the fire? Just this, Morgan. Why did Dean object to Larrabee's idea? Now, come on, don't look at Larrabee. He can't hurt you. Well... Waring asked you a question, Morgan. Answer him. 
Now, look, Morgan, we know Larrabee wanted to start a fire. We know Dean objected. Now, why did he object? With me money in his pocket, too. He was afraid Larrabee might talk. He said Larrabee can never keep his mouth shut. I see. Well, that does it. Does what? What are we trying to prove? Dean's motive. Motive for what? For starting the fire. Well, you mean Dean started the fire? Yes. You see, Dean was afraid to let Larrabee know that's what he intended to do. Yeah. So he nixed Larrabee's plan. Mm -hmm. But then he hired me to tail Larrabee so that I'd be a witness when the fire started that Larrabee had nothing to do with it. Yeah. And Dean hops a Chicago train, stays on it just long enough to establish his presence, then slips off the train, probably somewhere around Philly, and flies back to New York. Ah, I get it. He figures to start the fire, then hop a plane to Pittsburgh and slip back on the train there. That's right. That way both partners have an alibi for the fire. But Larrabee catches Dean at the fire and kills him. That's a lie. Why would I kill him if he's doing what I wanted? Well, uh... He's got a point, Corbett. Maybe he wanted all the insurance for himself. I don't know. Well, if you really want to know, don't ask Larrabee. Ask Morgan. Me? Why me? Because, Morgan, you're the one who killed Dean, aren't you? Wipe your eyes, Corbett. Maybe I'll pull a boner next week. Morgan confessed. He caught Dean starting the fire, and Dean threatened to frame him. He was going to use that row they had when he tried to fire Morgan as a motive and claim Morgan started the fire for revenge. Mm -hmm. Larrabee and Dean would have alibis, and that would leave Morgan holding the match. Right. It panicked Morgan, and he killed Dean. Oh, there it is, Waring. I'll just run along. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait a minute, Corbett. What kind of a straight man are you? Huh? You haven't asked me how I knew Morgan was the murderer. All right, go ahead. Well, Dean told his wife he was going to Palm Beach. Say, that's right. I forgot about Palm Beach. Well, so did Dean when he heard about the storm in Virginia. His original plan, apparently, was to work his alibi on a Palm Beach train. But bad weather made it risky, counting on a plane to get him back to the train. So he switches to a Chicago train. That's right. And Morgan said Dean told him he was going to Chicago. Dean left the club at 6, and Morgan claimed he hadn't seen him again. Still, when Dean left home at 8, he told his wife he was going to Palm Beach. So he hadn't switched plans by 8, which means Morgan was lying. He must have seen Dean again after 8. Mm. All right, Waring. Do you feel better now that you got that off your chest? Oh, yes, much better, Corbett. Thanks. Well, that's good, Waring. You need something to cheer you up. Do I? You will when I tell you. Morgan has confessed to the murder, but he still denies tipping off Larrabee about you tailing him. So it looks like it was just your own bungling. <laughs> Good night, Ware. Spring is in the air, folks. There's fair weather, sunny skies, trees and flowers in bloom. Everything, it seems, to make living enjoyable. One sure way to add pleasure to living these balmy days is to enjoy the wonderfully good taste of delicious, craft, dairy-fresh caramels. They're smooth and chewy, soft candy goodness through and through with a caramel flavor developed by Kraft from a special process, the result of years of fine candy making. Yes, Kraft caramels are good, and they're good for you, too. Dairy-fresh, they're called, and that means plenty of wholesome, nourishing milk is in Kraft Caramels. Get the big 50-pound bag at the grocery store or ask for the nickel bar of six delicious pieces of Kraft Caramels at the candy store. And when you taste them, I'm sure you'll say, these are the best caramels I've ever tasted. Kraft Dairy Fresh Caramels. <laughs> The Case of the Dutch Doll. The Case of the Dutch Doll. That's the title of next week's adventure of the Falcon, when Mike Waring learns that little boys who play with the wrong kind of dolls never live to grow up. So be sure to listen at this same time next week to another exciting adventure of the Falcon, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company. The Adventures of the Falcon, transcribed today, are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake, produced by Bernadelle Schubert, 
Written today by Jerome Epstein and directed by Richard Lewis. Music was by Arlo. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Ken Lynch as Sergeant Corbett. Be sure to hear the great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. The next Wednesday's broadcast, Gildy comes face to face with an hilarious problem and solves it in a way that will keep you laughing for days. Remember the show, the time and the place, the great Gildersleeve, next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. Check your local newspaper for time of broadcast. And Hermie, he's speaking for the Kraft Foods Company. One hour from now, Cary Grant and Betsy Drake star in another adventure as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings, the owners of the famous troublesome dream house. It's top Sunday listening, Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Here, Groucho Marx and Ginger Rogers on The Big Show, later on NBC. Hello? Yes, this is the Falcon speaking. Oh, Betty... I'm glad you called. Oh, you'll have to give me a rain check tonight, Angel. Some girl just dropped down with an interesting proposition, and I can't afford to pass it by. Yet I'll be hanged if I touch it. This is Ed Hurley, friends, inviting you on behalf of the Kraft Foods Company to listen to The Adventures of the Falcon, starring Les Damon. You met the Falcon first in his best-selling novel. Then you saw him in his thrilling motion picture series. Now join him on the air when the Falcon solves the case of the Dutch doll. Before we join the Falcon in a new and exciting adventure, here is something else that's new and exciting. Kraft salad oil, the wonderful new salad oil just put on the market for your home use by the makers of all those other wonderful Kraft products. Kraft salad oil is more than just a new salad oil. It's a new kind of salad oil. A lighter-bodied oil designed to mix smoothly and perfectly with all the other ingredients you use in your homemade salad dressings, your delicious chiffon cakes, in fact, in every recipe you have that calls for liquid shortening. The reason Kraft salad oil is a lighter-bodied oil is that it's made by a special process created by Kraft called superfining. The first time you try this wonderful new lighter-bodied, super-fine salad oil, you'll know you've discovered something really new, really wonderful. So don't wait. Get Kraft salad oil tomorrow. Look for the bottle with the beautiful label. And now, the case of the Dutch doll. It is late Sunday evening in New York. The kind of night where only Noah would feel at home. But Harry Roberts, the stocky gentleman in a wet overcoat, is no biblical character. Harry is Dutch Stevens' chief lieutenant, and right now he's on a mission for his boss. He tries the door of a nearby telegraph office. And finding it locked, begins banging on the glass. Hey, you. Open up. Come on, open up. What's the matter, you deaf? Just a second. Well, it's about time. I could float away out there. Boy. I want to send a couple of wires. Oh, I'm sorry, mister. We're closed for the night. Well, open up again. Now, one telegram... Oh, you don't goes... understand. It's the company rule. Well, change it. Hey, who do you think you are? Just a guy with a gun. <laughs> oh. Now, do we send those telegrams? Oh, well, sure. Sure. That's a good boy. Now, the same wire goes to three guys. Write down their names. George Hendricks, Hotel Fortunata, Chicago. Bill Rhinebeck, Daffodil Club, Reno, Nevada. And Christopher Londos, that's L-O-N-D-O-S. Hemsley Building, Los Angeles. Got that? Yeah. Must see you June 29th at my place. Must see you June 29th at my place. New York. New York. Anything else? No, that's all. Just sign at Dutch Stevens. Right, Stevens. Now, can you add a P.S. to the one going to Londis? You mean you want to continue the message to him? Yeah, bright. Make it read, this is it, and sign it Harry. Just those three words? Don't worry, Buster. Mr. Londis is a smart boy. He'll catch on. Now, uh, start pounding that out. Mr. Christopher 
London. Hemsley Building. Well, now, if you gentlemen will give me your attention for a moment. I'd like to explain the purpose of this meeting. You're probably wondering why I called it. Now that you mention it, we are. Well, I've been doing a little thinking lately, Londis. I've come to the conclusion it's pretty ridiculous for you, Hendricks, Rhinebeck, and myself to be constantly at each other's throats. Well, so what I propose is a combine. What's wrong with the agreement we've got now, Dutch? Nothing, except nobody's abided by it. You, Londis, have been running joints in my territory. Now, look here, Stephen. Don't bother denying it, Chris. I caught four of your hoods in New York last week. And don't tell me they came to see the Empire State Building. What's the matter? Didn't you try to open a club in Los Angeles? Sure I did. And what did it cost you to close it? Enough. That's exactly my point. Why spend time and money fighting each other? With one organization, we could cut down on overhead. I'm willing to bet now you'll increase your take at least 50%. And who is going to be head of this organization? I am. That's what I figure. And what's going to prevent you from, say, someday deciding you don't need Londos and freeze him out? I don't talk like a kid, Londos. No, I think I've got a very important point there. I don't know what you're saying. No, I think the rest of these boys are willing to go along. Am I right, gentlemen? <laughs> well, make up your mind, Londos. I think maybe I'd try it alone for a while. You're making a serious mistake. Could be. But you've got to prove it to me first. All right, Londos. And I don't imagine that it'll be quite as difficult as you think. There he comes now, Jerry. Open the door. Hello, Harry. Hi, Alanis. Get away from here fast. All right, Jerry. Suppose you drive around the park. No, no. Tell him to head out to our court. Relax, Harry. Everything's going to be okay. Not too sure, Alanis. Dutch is plenty sore. My, my, my. He make uh, any plans for me? Yeah. Sending eight men out to the coast tomorrow. You know their names? Yeah, I got them all written down. Here. Hmm. Steve Donahue, Albert Saber. Now, this is fine stuff, Harry. How they go? They fly. Taking the five o'clock plane. I see they get nice reception. Uh, tell him to watch out for Donahue. He's one of Dutch's best. Jerry, when we get back to the hotel, remind me to make a couple of calls. Uh... Listen, Landis, before you start the rough stuff, I still think you can make a deal with Dutch. No use, Harry. We already tried. Well, let me try once more. If I can work on him the right way... Okay, Harry, you work on him. But just the same, I think I'm going to make those calls. Is that you, Harry? Yeah. Yeah, you, you busy, Dutch? No, no, come on in. On your mind. Well, look, Dutch, I uh, I don't know how to say this. You don't know how to say what? Well, I've been with you for a long time. Fifteen years, isn't it? Yeah. Never once did I open my yap and give advice when it wasn't asked for. But obviously now you'd like to break a precedent, huh? I think you're making a big mistake in the way you're handling Londis. Well, what would you suggest I do? Give him a separate deal. Well, why is he entitled more than the others? Because he's a lot smarter. You're going to have trouble with him, Dutch. I doubt it. Look, boss, I, uh, I happen to know he'd take 10% extra. Well, how do you happen to know that? Well, one of his boys approached me. I thought I told you to stay away from I him. I couldn't help myself, Dutch. They dropped in at the Hawk Club last night. Well, make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. See who that is. Okay. All right, hold your horses. I'm coming. Hello, Harry. Kinsella. Yeah, it's me, pal. Well, when did you get out? This morning. Where's Dutch? Who is it, Harry? It's only me, Dutch. Well, what are you doing here, Kinsella? I want to thank you. For what? Didn't you spring me? No. Oh, quit kidding, Dutch. Who else would go to bat for me with the parole board? I wish I knew. It's funny. I thought for sure you... Well, what difference does it make? It's good to see you, Dutch. It's been a long time. Not long enough. I don't know what ideas you had. To... Well, when I went to stir, you were supposed to look after things. And I did, Kintella. Very capably, too, if I say so myself. And if you think you're coming back to get on my gravy train, you got another guest coming. So that's the way the wind blows. That's the way it blows. You got anything to say, Harry? He's the boss, Kintella. I can see that. Mr. Big Shot in person. 
And I think we two are probably the only ones left who remember how he got his nickname. Never mind the reminiscing. Yeah, I guess it's a sign of old age. Okay, Dutch, take care of yourself. So long, Harry. So long. What's the matter, Harry? You look worried. I am. You don't think it's an accident that Kinsella showed up at this time? Don't you? No. I tell you, Dutch, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. What you like, Harry, isn't too important. You could avoid all the trouble if you only made a deal with Landis. I told you I didn't want to discuss it first. Now, for Pete's sake, don't be so pig-headed. You know it's possible for you to be wrong once you don't... Okay. Sorry I lost my temper, Harry. That's all right, boss. Forget it. After all, a big man like you is entitled to lose his head once in a while. Hello? Western Union calling. Is this the home of Mr. Dutch Stevens? Yes. I have a cable for Mr. Stevens. Is he there? This is Mr. Stevens speaking. Oh, it's from London, Mr. Stevens. The message reads... Dear Father, can't wait to see you. Taking Clipper tomorrow morning. Arriving New York Friday. Love, Beatrice. Did you say Friday? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Harry. Harry. Yeah, mommy? Yes. Beatrice is coming home. What? She'll be here day after tomorrow. Well, you can't let her do that. What's the matter with you, Harry? You don't seem to realize I haven't seen my daughter in ten years. Well, then it won't hurt to wait another one. All we need now is a dame around here to complicate things. If you ask me... Well, go on. Wait a minute. You see what I did? Where? Window. Well, you're imagining things, Harry. No. Get down, boy! Don't do it! Dutch. Dutch! Yes? They told me I could find Michael Waring here. I don't know who the they are, but they told you right. Are you the one they call the Falcon? When they can't think of anything worse. What's your name? Beatrice Stevens. Well, come in. Thank you. Uh, sit down. If you don't mind, I'd rather stand. All right, suit yourself. Now, what can I do for you, Miss Stevens? Well, I don't know if you can do anything. Well, I certainly can't if I don't know the problem. Well, to begin with, Dutch Stevens was my father. And what is that supposed to mean? Just? So you believe those stories, too? What do you mean by those stories? That he was a common gangster. Well, wasn't he? No. It's a lie. You mean there was nothing common about him? My father was a great man, Mr. Waring. Those stories were spread by his enemies. But Daddy never harmed a soul in his life. Well, it's too bad Capone isn't around to hear that. He would have enjoyed it. I won't have you talk that way about my father. Look, Miss Stevens, I know the Bible says honor thy parents, but believe me, they never had a guy like Dutch Stevens in mind. You're lying. Well, why do you think he was killed? I don't know. But it must be part of some gigantic conspiracy. Hey, wait a minute. You actually believe that, don't you? Of course. You never read about Dutch Stevens' exploits? No. Where have you been all these years? In England, at Bedford School. Oh, pretty fancy. You know it? Only by reputation. When was the last time you saw your father? Ten years ago. You know anybody in town? No. Then how did you get my name? I asked a police officer to recommend a good private detective. Oh. And just what do you expect this detective to do for you? Find my father's murderer. Well, that's a job for the police. You've got to help me, Mr. Waring. I don't know how I'm going to reimburse you, but I'll manage somehow. Are you kidding? I'll get a job. A daughter of Dutch Stevens working? What happened to all his money? What money? Look, your old man was loaded, Beatrice. Rumor has it that in the last two years alone, he managed to put away a couple of million. Now, where is it? I have no idea. Well, as his only child, you're entitled to it. Aren't you interested? No. Well, it interests me. Then you'll find out who killed my father. Yeah, let's put it this way, Angel. I'll try and find out what happened to his money. And if, incidentally, I can turn up his murderer, that's so much velvet. <laughs> Lighter body. It's super fine. It's Kraft Salad Oil, the first salad oil ever offered for your home use by the makers of those wonderful Kraft salad dressing products. 
The first time you use Kraft salad oil in one of your own homemade salad dressings or in one of those big, beautiful chiffon cakes you make or in any recipe that calls for liquid shortening, you'll know you've found a treasure. For Kraft salad oil is more than just a new salad oil. It's a new kind of salad oil, a lighter-bodied salad oil that blends perfectly with other ingredients. That's because Kraft salad oil is super-fined salad oil. Yes, super-fined by a special process created by Kraft. Because it's super-fined, it's lighter-bodied. Because it's lighter-bodied, it blends new magic into your salad dressing, baking, and cooking masterpieces. So don't wait to try this new Kraft salad oil. Remember... It's lighter bodied. It's super fine. Get Kraft salad oil tomorrow at your grocer's. Look for the bottles with the beautiful label. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. 24 hours have passed since Mike Waring was hired by Dutch Stevens' daughter Beatrice to discover her father's killer. And now we find the Falcon making the grand tour. And his first port of call is a small bar on 86th Street. Well, well, if it isn't Jack Kinsella. Wary. When did you get out? A couple of days ago. You know, by rights, I ought to talk to you, Wary. Why did you refuse to help me when they framed me on that smuggling wreck? Well, in the first place, I wasn't asked. Didn't Dutch Stevens try to hire you? Was he supposed to? Why, that dirty, rotten liar. That no good... Now, don't stop on my account, Kinsella. I'm over 21. The friend Dutch gave you a double cross, huh? What do you think? I think if he did, he paid for it. <laughs> Meaning you believe I gunned him, huh? The cops will decide that. You're barking up the wrong tree, man. Uh, well, look, Kinsella, you don't have to explain to me. I'm just interested in one thing. Would you know where I could locate Harry Roberts? Why? Because I'm working for Dutch Stevens' daughter. Beatrice? Yeah, you know her. I heard Dutch mention her once or twice. Well, she's a young lady of property, Kinsella, only we can't seem to locate the property. What's that got to do with Harry? Oh, I thought that being Dutch's closest friend, he might be the custodian. I wouldn't know. Any more questions? Yeah, just one. How did you get out? What do you mean? Well, as I recall it, your sentence was 10 to 20. You didn't serve anywhere near that. I got friends. Well, lucky you. Who was it, Harry Roberts? What makes you think it was Harry? Just a hunch. Suppose Harry planned on having Dutch knocked off for his dough. He might want you on the scene to take the rap. You're crazy as they come, Mike. Well, who got your parole? I told you. I got friends. Okay, Kinsella. Boy like you couldn't possibly have more than one, so it shouldn't be any great problem to run him down. Homicide, Sergeant Corbett. Hello, Corbett. This is Mike Waring. Hi, Mike. I understand you're on the Stevens case. Yeah, that's right. Now, look, Corbett, I'm trying to find out if it was Harry Roberts who put up the bail for Jack Kinsella. Well, why don't you ask me? Okay, I'm asking. Kinsella apparently didn't know anything about it. From what I understand, it was put up by a fellow who's here from the coast, a guy named Christopher Landis. <laughs> Londos? That's right. My name is Mike Waring. Waring? I'm a private detective. Oh, the Falcon. Come in. I've appointed myself a committee of one to welcome you to New York and to thank you for all you've done for us here by giving us back Jack Kinsella. You're a very funny boy, Waring. Well, I don't think Bob Hope has anything to worry about. What's on your mind? There's that little trouble with Dutch Stevens. Who didn't? Well, after I learned you secured the parole for Kinsella, I got to wondering what your motive might be. And you decided... Uh... That you knew Dutch Stevens double-crossed him, and you hoped he'd make Dutch regret it. You talk very interesting, Mr. Waring. Let me hear more. Now, you said I figure Kinsella is going to take care of Dutch Stevens for me. Did I say that? Yeah. And he's only one trouble. How do I know that Dutch double-crossed Kinsella? Well, that's the simplest thing in the world. Harry Roberts told you. What did you say? Oh, now, careful, friend. That's a new suit. Listen, Waring. What are you looking for? Harry Roberts. Why? I think he may know what happened to Dutch Stevens' money. I'm working for Dutch's daughter. That's not a good enough reason, Waring. Take my advice. Stop looking. Good 
you've made absolutely no progress at all, Mr. Waring. What do you call progress, Beatrice? Well, you haven't discovered who killed my father. Well, I told you, Angel, I wasn't looking for his murderer. That's a job for the police. But what have they accomplished? Well, give them time. They do all right. All I want to do is look after your interests. And that means getting you a bundle of cash. I told you I wasn't interested in money. Yeah, well, you'll find it's a mighty comforting thing to have around in your old age. Now, as I see it, your old man was the kind who always tied up his dough in cash. And he must have socked it away someplace. That should be comparatively simple to check, shouldn't it? No, just the opposite. The only party who probably knows the complete details is Harry Roberts. Uncle Harry. Oh, you remember him? Oh, very well. As a matter of fact, I heard from him about an hour ago. What? Yes. Well, in heaven's name, why didn't you mention that before? You didn't ask me. Oh, well, I guess that's a good enough reason. Where do you say he was? Is there such a place as the Kendrake? There's a Mandrake Hotel on Madison Avenue. Yes, that's the one. All right, what are we waiting for? Come on, I'll call a cab. And... Don't bother Waring. I got a car. Mr. Waring. All right, all right. Nothing to be frightened of, Beatrice. This is Jack Kinsella. He's a former fraternity brother of your father's. You're a very comical fella. Didn't your new boss warn you? My new boss? Yeah, Chris Londos. What makes you think I'm working for him? Or well, aren't you? No, and the whole sister. Where do you think you're going? Well, I thought I'd... Sure, be... but wait till Mr. Waring and I leave. Oh, I'm not leaving, Kinsella. I like it here. I don't blame you, but just the same, you and I are going to catch a little air. I guess you want me to catch it right through the middle, huh? That's the general idea. Well, in that case... Oh, why, you know... Look good. out, Mr. Waring! No! Oh. Well, you want to play rough, huh? Oh! Take it easy, Mike. Who are you? Sergeant Corbett. Oh, naturally. What am I doing in a hospital? <clears throat> Never mind. I remember now. You're a lucky boy. Well, if your head felt like mine does, you wouldn't think so. At that, you shouldn't complain. If it hadn't been for Miss Stevens screaming, Kinsella might have killed you. You pick him up? Yeah, it was no trouble at all. Look, you want to hold on to him, Sergeant. I think you've got Dutch Stevens' killer there. Why? But what other reason would he have for coming after me? He claims he thought you were trying to pin it on him. I'm not trying to pin it on anybody. All I want is to find Harry Roberts. Oh, I can tell you that. You can? Well, where is Harry? In the morgue. What? In the morgue, Mike. And with three slugs in his brain, I don't think he's in the mood to do much talking. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back again, Londo. Only this time I brought along my gang. This is Sergeant Corbett. Glad to know you, Corbett. How bad? Uh, you've been listening to Waring. You can't believe everything he tells you. I don't know. He's a pretty convincing talker. Yeah, he would make a good salesman. Well, wait till you hear the idea I've sold him. I'm waiting. Mike thinks you killed Harry Roberts. Why should I? To cover up the murder of Dutch Stevens. You've got it all figured out, haven't you? Uh, sure. You were working with Harry all along. And when you felt we were getting warm, you decided to get rid of them. I'm afraid you're going to have to start all over again, because I got A1 alibi. What do you call A1? At a quarter to two, I was having a little interview with the district attorney. How did you know when Harry died? Been on the radio. Right, Sergeant? Yeah. Corbett, there's some sort of a swindle going on here. I'll bet if you check with the DA... That won't take a minute. Your call, please. Get me the district attorney's office. Suppose you make... That call downstairs. What are you worried about, Landis? I'll give you a dime. Listen, Sergeant. How can I if you keep talking? DA's office, Clayton speaking. Hello, Clayton. Sergeant Corbett. Oh, what's on your mind, Sergeant? Did the DA have Chris Landis on the carpet today at 145? No. The DA hasn't been in all day. You are sure about that, Clayton? Positive. So if Landis claims he spoke to him at 145, he's lying. He was here, talking to me. Tomorrow at your grocer's, remember to pick up a pint or quart bottle of wonderful new Kraft salad oil. The first salad oil ever offered for your home use by the makers of all those other wonderful Kraft salad dressing products. Try this new salad oil in your homemade salad dressings, your baking, your cooking. It's lighter bodied because it's super fine. Look for the bottles with the beautiful labels. Get Kraft Salad Oil. Now, back to the adventures of the Falcon. 
An hour has passed since Mike discovered that Chris Londos had a perfect alibi for the time of Harry Roberts' murder. And now as we find Mike, he is about to break the unhappy news to his client. Just a second. Hello, Beatrice. Oh, Mr. Waring. I thought you were in the hospital. Well, I didn't like the service. Did you hear about Harry Roberts? Yes. Who did it? I voted for Londos. Yes? Well, they tossed out my ballot. He's got what the pulp writers call an ironclad alibi. Couldn't one of his men have done it? Well, I never thought of that. Still, I didn't see anyone in this suite in the hotel. He might be staying somewhere else. Yes, you're right, Angel. But uh, there's a more immediate problem. What? Oh, I think that's for me. Hello? Yes, it's Waring. What? Okay, thanks. What were you saying, Mr. Waring? Hmm? Oh, uh... I was wondering what I was going to do about you. I've let you down pretty badly. Not at all. Yes, I have. First of all, with Harry dead, we're never going to find out what happened to Duchess Bankrow. That's not your fault. Well, I should have known Harry was living on borrowed time. How could you possibly? Because the same party who killed Dutch had to kill Harry, too. You mean for his own protection? No, I mean for her own protection. I think that calls for an explanation, don't you? I don't see why, Beatrice. I was under the impression the statement was perfectly clear. Since there's only one woman in this case, naturally, it could only mean you. Where do you want me to drop you, Mike? Oh, anywhere along here will be all right. I don't have to tell you how surprised I was when I got your call to pick up Dutch's daughter. Well, I got another surprise for you. She wasn't his real daughter. What? Sure. That's what put me on the right track. I don't get it. Well, I had two prime suspects in this case. One, Harry Roberts. And when Harry was murdered, obviously that ruled him out. Oh, that must have made him feel good. <laughs> Number two was Chris Londos. And he had a perfect alibi. That's right, so I had to start looking again. And all of a sudden it occurred to me there was one wrong note in this opera. Beatrice? Yes, she came to me with a story that she didn't know how she was going to pay me for my services because she thought her father was broke. Didn't make sense. Why not? Well, according to her own story, she spent the last ten years in a fancy boarding school in England. The money for her tuition had to come from somewhere. Uh, she overplayed her hand. Well, once I hit on that, the rest was easy. So, I checked Scotland Yard. Uh-huh. And now you learned the real Beatrice Stevens was still in London. Yeah, this gal was just trying to pick up a fast million by posing as Dutch Stevens' daughter. Hey, how about that? How about what? All that filthy lucre being buried somewhere. <laughs> Think it'll ever turn up? Uh, I doubt it. You know, a man could do a lot with that kind of money. Why don't you try to find it, Mike? Oh, I'm the practical type, Corbett. If I'm going to spend my time looking. I'd sooner hunt for something more interesting. What's more interesting than money? Women. So let me off at the next block, and I'll start my search there. Ever find yourself at a loss when you need a hot main dish in a hurry? Well, don't let that happen to you. Always keep a package or two of Kraft Dinner on your pantry shelf. Because with Kraft Dinner, you can make delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. Tender, fluffy macaroni with perfect cheese flavor all through it. You see, every package of Kraft Dinner gives you a special quick-cooking macaroni and just the right amount of Kraft grated to sprinkle in for wonderful cheese flavor. And Kraft Dinner can be your answer to today's high prices because every package makes four servings at a cost of just a few pennies each. Tomorrow, get a package or two of handy, delicious Kraft Dinner. <laughs> The Case of the Curious Cop. The Case of the Curious Cop. That's the title of next week's Adventure of the Falcon, when Mike Waring learns that for some special problem, a policeman has a cult special answer. So be sure to listen at this same time next week to another exciting Adventure of the Falcon, brought to you by the Kraft Foods Company. The Adventures of the Falcon are based on the famous character created by Drexel Drake. Produced by Bernard L. Schubert, written today by Eugene Wang, and directed by Richard Lewis. Music was by Arlo. Les Damon was starred as the Falcon with Ken Lynch as Sergeant Corbin. Be sure to hear The Great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. 
In next Wednesday's broadcast, Gildy comes face to face with a hilarious problem and solves it in a way that will keep you laughing for days. Remember the show, the time, and the place. A great Gildersleeve next Wednesday evening over most of these stations. Check your local newspaper for time of broadcast. This is Ed Hurley. He's speaking for the Kraft Food Company. Russell and Russell and Melvin Douglas both star on Theater Gale tonight on NBC.